Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 10. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey everyone, this is Nathan Biggs with Brow Time Productions, and you're listening to Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast, and I am very excited to be here with you today. We have a fantastic lineup. We are doing part one today of our show with the Queens of Camo. And if you don't know who the Queens of Camo are, they are a all-woman hunting party group troop, I would say, that have started a a movement of women hunters. And uh, we get to speak with them about every little detail that's going on in their lives, find out how they started hunting. We got to talk about how they started the Queens of Camo and where it's going to go. We got to talk about every little thing that uh, we like to know about on the Big Buck Registry from what type of bows they like to shoot to socks to all kinds of things. So just stay tuned and listen in. It's a great show. And then after part one, uh, we're actually going to launch part two uh, pretty much at the same time. So you can finish up uh, and listen to another 35 minutes with the Queens of Camo. So here we go. Welcome back to the show, everybody. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. And I am here today with the Queens of Camo. I have Candice, Nina, and Hannah on the line with me right now. And welcome to the show, everybody. Hi. Hey, Jay. Uh, we're, we're pretty psyched to have you guys on the show. We, um, it's not very often that we, uh, see a bunch of ladies, um, toting around in some camo and talking about hunting. So we're loving this. Well, we're excited to, uh, kind of be ambassadors for women in, in the hunting industry and just outdoors in general. Um, there's not a huge voice out there, uh, for the women in the outdoors. So we're kind of excited to be here too. Very cool. Uh, Candace, um, tell us a little bit about the Queens of Camo. How did they come together? What are they all about? Well, they were seeking um, women who are real huntresses, not professionals, who just do this in their daily lives. And um, from the beginning, they kind of sought out uh, our kind of our bio and a video from us, and they narrowed it down to um, a select group of girls, and we kind of went through an application process type thing. And then they picked us up from there based on, you know, what we do and how we represent ourselves and, and that we are real women in the outdoors. And this is our life. It's not just a hobby. This is something that we do every day. So they formed together in hopes of reaching out to women and creating more than just a TV show, but a forum and a place where women can come and learn from us. Gotcha. Uh, who is they? They would be um, our director and our producer. Uh, Nicholas Barton is the owner of Prestigious Films, and they're kind of the production company behind this whole thing. Him and his wife uh, developed this vision of introducing women into the outdoors in a much broader aspect, mm-hmm. and that's kind of the vision that we have. He made a comment at one point where he said, when a man goes hunting, a man goes hunting. But when a woman goes hunting, the whole family goes hunting. So there's a big part of Queens of Camo where, you know, we want to reach out and get dads to take their daughters out hunting and um, introduce women who would have never even thought about getting into the outdoors into it. And by us being just regular girls who haven't hunted professionally and, you know, there's a lot of new stuff that we're going to be learning along the way and it allows women to relate to us so they can see, you know what, they're just regular girls doing this. So maybe I can do it, too. Right. That's a cool message. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, so each of you were, were found by this group of, uh, is a filmmaker of sorts, right? Or a, a production company? Correct. It's a production company and he developed a vision based off of some experiences he had and 
we just happened to be some of the lucky ones that were selected. Cool. And it, there was a process, uh, like an application process? Yeah. Um, we uh, had to answer a bunch of first kind of generic um, questions about our hunting experience and then um, I guess to weed through the people that he wanted and didn't want. And then we had to uh, to send in video application or a video um, answering questions and kind of telling him about ourselves and, and then more questions and mm -hmm. then um, another video, more questions, and then they picked us. And it was, it was neat, though, because Candace and I actually um, live in the same area. We were both here in South Texas, and we didn't even know each other. So um, Queens of Camo actually brought the two of us together, and now we're like great hunting buddies, and I'm really, really grateful for that because without the Queens of Camo, I never would have met her. So, That's cool. That's yeah. cool. Now, Hannah, you're a, you're a recent addition to the Queens of Camo, correct? Yes, I am, uh, as of uh, a couple weeks ago. Woo-hoo! <laughs> that's something to celebrate right there. I think yep. that's, that's Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah, um, I'm totally excited. Now, Hannah, where are you located? I am in Connecticut, New York area, so okay. I'm currently the only East Coast rep. You're the East Coast rep. Okay. <laughs> so you're kind of closer to us. We're, we're in New Hampshire, and uh, yep. we're, we're a little more familiar with that area. Gotcha. And, and Candace and Nina, where are you out of? We are both uh, down in South Texas. South Texas. Yes, uh, I love Texas. I think that's a great state. Um, tell us a little about uh, how you, how this, each of you got into hunting in the first place. Um, well, I started probably at a much later age than a lot of women. I grew up fishing since I was teeny tiny with my mom. She was a huge fisherwoman, and I just grew up in the outdoors to begin with. Um, my dad was a big gun enthusiast, but we never really had a place to hunt. So other than hunting squirrels in the backyard or anything like that, I didn't really have that experience until I met my husband um, probably about 10 years ago now. Uh, and he is a huge country boy, grew up on the farm, hunted their entire life and everything. And so um, the first year we were dating, he actually asked my father if he could take me hunting. And my dad was ecstatic, like, please take her. You know, she grew up around guns and... After he took me, I was hooked. I had always loved the outdoors, but, you know, just going and actually experiencing a hunt. And um, then we both, a couple years later, we um, decided to pick up bow hunting. And that's kind of been my addiction ever since. I think it's been six years since I wanted to pick up a rifle after I took my first animal with a bow. So right. that's kind of how I got started into it. Nina, how did you get into hunting? Um, well, I, uh, I... And um, my my dad didn't have boys, and I grew up um, in South Texas as well. And I grew up actually um, on a little island called Port Aransas. So I grew up deep sea fishing, and my grandmother has property around um, in Kingsville. And I grew up on ranches and hunting dove, and it was just something we did, but more so for food than really the sport of it. And then later on in life, um, uh, I got into I was probably eighteen when I started. Um, really waterfowl hunting. I uh, um, I guess Corpus and Choke Canyon, you wouldn't think that South Texas has really good waterfowl, but it does. Uh, we have a lot of um, like bay areas where you can set up blinds. It's public land, and it, I, I really got addicted to waterfowl hunting about 10 years ago. Oh, I'm kind of forgetting that I'm 30. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It sneaks well, up. Yeah. 12 it? years ago, yeah. It sneaks up on you, doesn't it? 28 and holding. Right. Um, no, but, um, I, uh, I'm new to bow hunting. I started bow hunting about, um, two years ago because my husband got into that and like Candace, it's very addicting. But my first love I would have to say is waterfowl. Okay. Um, I did taxidermy for a little bit and, um, about two and a half years for a local uh, taxidermist. And that's when I really like got to learn the anatomy of, of birds and ducks. And I kind of got, um, borderline obsession with, with ducks and, um, I kind of have, um, well, the issue with shotguns. I'm a huge fan of shotguns. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I'm a girly tomboy. I would, I like me you know, to get dressed up and be all girly, but I would rather you buy me a Satori than a pair of diamond earrings. <laughs> That's outstanding. I love that. Hannah, how about yourself? How did you get in hunting? Uh, Nina, I'm with you. I, uh, I'm the son of the family. My <laughs> poor father was blessed with three daughters. Um, so I took it up at a very, very young age, uh, just 
I like to say that it was, you know, the time that I got to spend with my dad without my sisters vying for his attention or anything. He's the only one that was interested in it. Um, we grew up as, you know, the kids that never had a video game. If you wanted to play, you went outside. And we've always been going up to the Adirondack uh, my whole life. So my dad would take me out to the tiny cabin and we'd sit on, you know, the snow and just wait for a buck. I'm sure I always like to joke with my mom. My dad probably was terrified that we actually would see a deer and like, what would this eight year old girl do if she saw a dead animal? (laughs) But it just really, you know, made me love the wilderness and everything. And um, I actually got my boyfriend into hunting and was the one that said, hey, daddy, can I uh, bring a boy shooting with us? (laughs) Which I'm sure was terrifying. (laughs) But um, he fell in love with it and got really into waterfowl. He is obsessed with turkey and all bird hunting. I'm more of a big game hunter. So we sort of introduced each other to, he introduced me to waterfowl. I introduced him to big game. And it's been a huge passion in our relationship ever since. That's excellent. So you brought the boy to the to the hunting grounds instead of the I did. That's awesome. Good for you. I did. Very nice. Now, who came up with the name Queens of Camo? Um, I think they actually put it out on a couple different forums to get some ideas, but I don't think that it came from there. Um, I'm pretty sure it came from either the director or the producer behind it all. So uh, you're where exactly in New York are you right now? I'm in Manhattan right now. You are? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I grew up in Connecticut and spent every summer in the Adirondacks where uh, we got 400 acres just outside of Tupper Lake. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's pretty much, we're bordered by 10,000 acres of private land and then another couple, like 2,000 or 3,000 of uh, Nature Conservancy. So we're okay. totally isolated up there. It's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, it's really fun. Have you joined in on any of the um, video campaigns so far? No. no. They've only had the, um, as far as I know, they've only had the one, the pilot, which is up on the website. Okay. Um, and I came, you know, after that all came about. Okay. Gotcha. Um, now, do you watch television? Yes. You do? Okay. I, I, I tend not to these days. I don't know why. Um, I used to watch a lot more as a kid, but just. I seem to find more things to do outside than anything. You're, see, Nina, you were saying that your favorite type of hunting is is waterfowl. Well, I mean, I, if I absolutely had to pick, I would say um, it's my favorite. But I, I like different. I mean, I just found bow hunting last two or three years, and it's hard to just pick one. I mean, and you'll ask other people who hunt, it, you, you, you put your foot in this little avenue, deer hunting or pig hunting, bow hunting, hu- hunting birds. It's all, if you love one, you really, you find that you love them all. But if I had to pick the most, the one that I'm most experienced at and that I think I, um, I, I really took to was the birds. And I think it's just because I grew up watching birds and the whole taxidermy thing, like seeing the anatomy of the animals and knowing just there's so many different species of ducks. And right. I like, I had this, um, I guess, trophy list that uh, you would say. And I'm starting with, of course, the South Texas one because there are several species I haven't shot here. But I have been obsessed with trying to get a cinnamon teal. I have a blue wing and a green wing mounted. And to finish my teal mount, I've been, I mean, I've never even seen a cinnamon teal because they're not um, sea ducks. They're not around in the bays. But I've been to Choke Canyon, and I'm just a, I'm, I'm a, I have this little obsession with certain species of ducks. So I guess, yeah, if you're <laughs> to answer your question, long and drawn out, duck hunting probably would be my favorite. Okay. And uh, Candace, what's your favorite? Um, I would have to say hog hunting. Um, I love deer hunting, and and the preparation and the dedication and the hours and everything that go into it, but Especially in Texas, there's something about hunting wild hogs that just absolutely gets my adrenaline running. Um, and I think one of the reasons why is because I love taking people to go hunt hogs, especially uh, new women or new hunters, because there's less pressure, I think, 
with hogs, there's no size, there's no limit, there's no, um, you know, it's a trophy this or a trophy that, or he's not old enough, or uh, she, he doesn't have a big enough rack or, or anything like that. There's no pressure to worry about all that. And then a lot of women, sometimes starting out, have a concern about um, harvesting a deer because of their beauty and how majestic they are and things like that. So sometimes you can break them into that by taking them to hunt these evil, destructive hogs, and they know <laughs> at the same time they're they're crazy. I'm not gonna lie; they get they get pretty evil, and especially when you're hunting them at night. Um, and so breaking them into hunting that way, uh, I think, is a cool thing because they can also see the effects. Um, firsthand when you go out to an area that's infested with hogs you can see the destruction that they've caused to the farmer's crops or to you know your neighbor's garden or something like that so there's more of an incentive that it's okay to take down these animals because you're doing a good thing and people almost always will invite you to their land for free just to come and rid their land of these animals but um, I've hunted them with guns and everything before but in the past couple years, uh, not only have we started, or have I started taking them with bow, but we've been doing a lot of night stalking with them, which is a complete adrenaline rush like no other. Uh, I recently went on a hunt that you weren't allowed to have firearms, so you had to have a knife and a bow, and that was really it, and you were trapped in this area kind of with them and you were hunting them at night, you have your red lights, and you stalk them. And if you have the wind right, the wind's in their face, you're in the right place, is what I always say, because you will never, ever beat a pig's nose. So if you can get the wind right, you can, sometimes you can almost walk right up onto them. I've killed one at 10 yards because the wind was perfect and he had no idea I was there. So I would say my love for hog hunting is, is probably the biggest thing going on right now. With okay, me. gotcha. And Hannah, what about you? What's your favorite? Well, you know, I would have to say being from the Northeast, uh, you know, of course, white tail's big for me. Right. I see more white tail on my driveway than I do hunting sometimes. Right. Uh, it's always a bummer, but um, definitely caribou. It's sort of sentimental to me. That was my first big game animal that I took with my dad. The tundra, We, you know, we were up in northern Canada. The tundra is beautiful, um, but... The thing that you can find me hunting like most frequently is uh, rough grouse. Okay. We, uh, we have a ton on our property. Um, we also have actually a lot of spruce grouse, which are endangered. So you know you ha we you have to watch out and be a little careful. But um, it's we have the DEC up there coming to study the grouse population because it's so abundant, thriving. And there's something really cool about an animal that doesn't move unless you stop. Right. And that sound that they make when they take off, you know, a lot of times scares the crap out of people. And it's really, it, it gets your heart pumping. So you're trying to look where that sound is coming from and get your gun up and take a perfect shot. Definitely. Right. Yeah. Gr grouse are interesting. I've, uh, I've never heard of anybody studying them. It seemed like I just grew up with them. So it's, they're just, yeah, exactly. seem, they just seem to always be around. Um, well, the spruce grouse are only endangered, apparently, in our area specifically elsewhere they're totally abundant but here they're very rare so right interesting um you can come to hogs need to be eradicated they're not rare at all <laughs> yeah not at all yeah hogs can be a very destructive animal it's horrible my grandma they're going through a bad drought and she didn't have them on her land for two years and because of the drought she has a water source the last two months they have just annihilated her crops and um it's to the point where they can't trap because the the uh, the baby calves will get in the traps so you have to hunt them right you have to kill two with guns with the cattle so it's like bow hunting or it's just it's it's horrible actually yeah they're very destructive they're, they're also very uh tough they're probably one of the toughest animals on the planet when it comes to trying Absolutely. to hunt them right yeah they have um they have pretty thick skin uh, when we skinned out a couple, I mean, you can get an inch of just fat and, and skin, and they have a, a really thick shoulder plate that's hard to penetrate. Um, but yeah, they're they're definitely resilient, and they multiply at an insane rate. Your hogs can reproduce at six months old, so if you just do the math on you know just one litter, 
even if half of those are female, in six months they're going to multiply and, and quadruple in just such a short amount of time. So they're definitely overrun. And They have bounties on their own on, in some counties in Texas. They'll pay you to bring them pills. The county will. Is that, that right? Uh-huh. And they, they taste good, too. Oh, right? they're delicious. Right. Yeah, you definitely have to... Uh, uh, pick your size for some of your boars, and um, I've shown people kind of some different pictures where you have some hogs that have a little bit more Russian in them, and so they're a little bit more square, and they're a little bit more tough, but if you can get a, a boar under 200 pounds, they're usually, you know, still pretty good eating, and definitely your sows will uh, will always be a tasty, tasty porker to eat, for <laughs> sure, so... They're dirty though. They'll, you know, they'll, they're covered in ticks, and they're half the time covered in mud. They're they're nasty. Like Candace <laughs> and when she was saying, they're mean and nasty. They are right. definitely mean and nasty. Now, do you uh, do you end up butchering your own animals, or do you have somebody else do it for you? A little bit of both. For me, um, we always scan and quarter our animals out within probably an hour or two. If it's extremely hot, I mean, we'll do it right then and there. In Texas, you very rarely will leave an animal to hang overnight. Um, so a lot of times what we'll do is uh, we'll scan and quarter them out and get them on ice as soon as possible. Um, we usually will keep the back strap, the tenderloin, and um, if in the case of the pigs, we'll, we'll keep some of the ribs and just butterfly those out ourselves and keep them. But a lot of times we'll take the shoulders and the hams in to get them processed into sausage or, or uh, hamburger meat or something like that. But... If we have three uh, three freezers that are full year round, and then whatever we can't keep, we you know obviously give to my family or my husband's family or you know anybody that's willing to take it. So right, I, I know you had uh, we sent a few tweets back and forth while we we're setting up the show, and you had just gone on a, a hog hunt, correct? Yes, uh, sir. Last week, and uh, we went. Uh, me and my husband actually went two weekends in a row, and it was kind of neat because we went back to the ranch that we got married on. So right. it was kind of <laughs> sentimental because I mean that's that's what we do, and um, so we went down there, and it was actually kind of a, a neat experience as well. Something that I've never experienced before. I've never hunted them so close to a river, and we were set up literally 30 yards from the river and so as I'm sitting there and the sun's going down they they've pretty much gone nocturnal we had a little bit of a full moon and I actually heard them jumping in the water and swimming across and then they would you know come out to come feed and it was just it was really crazy because I didn't even know what the sound was and it just it got my heart pumping and then here came probably 60 hogs um, out from under the fence that had just swam across the river. Wow. So. And this was your recent hunt on your last trip? Yes, sir. That was wow. about, um, not this last weekend, the weekend before. We went. Gotcha. And are you recently married? Um, it'll be two years in June. Two years, okay. Yeah, yeah. for a little over nine years, married for almost two. Gotcha. Tell me about the tweet that you sent out the other day. It was something about... Um, it's almost a perfect day. Something about you were hunting hogs in the morning and picking up uh, a group of bridesmaids in the afternoon. Oh, no, it was, um, we had hunted the hogs and we had dropped off some of the meat at, at the processor. And so I think it was on Monday, I went and picked up the hog meat. And then the very next day, my afternoon errand was to go pick up a bridesmaid's dress or a matron of honor for a wedding that would be in. So it was just such a contrast <laughs> between my afternoon errands between, right. you know, hog meat and then a bridesmaid's dress. So That makes for an interesting day. No question <laughs> about it. Excellent. I have, I, for a beginner, I have been blessed with some really neat experiences. Um, uh, for one, the the pilot episode at uh, Queens of Camo, um, the, the first episode at Hewlin Ranch, that was an extraordinary experience. And we've been back since. Um, and in Hog hunting at night is something that is, um, it's, it, it's a thrill. It's exciting. It's a lot of fun. And that was something that was introduced to me with Queens of Camo. Um, I harvested a black buck antelope. Um, Texas has a lot of free range exotics. And, um, I have a, a lease in the Lakey area and I was able to harvest a black buck antelope. And I'd been looking at two in this bachelor group for about two years and, they're pretty territorial, so they'll stay on the ranch. It's a low fence ranch. Um, but, uh, my husband kept on 
tell me you need to wait, you need to wait. Well, um, he, he gave me the go ahead, uh, cause it's extra. It's, um, our, the black buck is extra on the lease. So, um, I needed, you know, to be sure before I try to harvest one that it was okay. Well, he gave me the go ahead if I could shoot one with the bow. Well, I didn't think he anticipated me harvesting it because after I did so, he was like, oh man, I never would have said that if I thought you could actually do it. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah. But that's kind of the whole, um, I guess they underestimated and even my husband knowing my abilities and stuff. Um, I don't, it, it, you sometimes being a woman, you are underestimated even by your family members, but I was able to harvest that black buck and it was an awesome experience. And let me tell you, that is some of the best wild game I've ever had. It's like if a cow had a baby with an axis deer, that is what black buck antelope tastes like. And I had no clue what it was going to taste like. And someone had harvested a, a axis deer that night. And we did this like blind taste test mm -hmm. to where we, um, we cooked both back straps and only one person knew which one was which. And everyone thought the black buck was the axis. So it's amazing meat. It so, really is. So black buck antelope. And, yeah, they're from India, but they got loose on some ranches in Texas and they breed in the wild now. Um, so do axis deer and fallow deer. They're really abundant in the, um, northern Texas and, and up in the hill country around, um, we have a lot of free range exotics and all dads. We have wild goats. It's amazing the climate that, um, the animals that are resilient and can live and thrive in Texas. Right. It seems like Texas would hold or has the capacity to hold some <laughs> more exotics. I don't think it would happen in the Northeast necessarily. Um, but the climate in Texas seems like it could take care of some of those exotics. That's really cool. So we basically got a, um, a population of exotics that live in Texas. So if you wanted to go hunt exotics, Texas might be the great place to go and you don't need a passport, basically. Exactly. <laughs> and it costs like a fraction of the price. And there are a lot of them are free range. You don't have to go to a high fence ranch. I mean, you can drive down the highway um, and, and see them. It's really amazing, actually. That's amazing. I never even put that together, but that, that just opened up a whole new world for me. Thank you very much for doing that. You're welcome. And you know what else? There's not a season on them because they're exotics. Wow. And different because their breeding isn't because there isn't a season it's hard sometimes when you're chasing one or if you're chasing a trophy because you're not exactly sure when he's going to drop they're going to drop their um their antlers right because it's since you know they're they're not native here there's different times and especially if you're hunting for meat and you're hunting um axis deer you have to be careful if the deer is running underneath um if you see a deer go underneath a tree and he, it looks like a big doe and it ducks its head, it's probably not a doe and it's a, 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 a buck that's dropped his antlers. You got to be real careful because you don't want to shoot one without them. Okay. All right. Well, that, that's, that's a great tip for our, our listeners is that, um, we're about big bucks. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a whitetail buck. It could be other species of, of, uh, animals that you could hunt. And, uh, and we're about hunting in general, but that sounds like, uh, that could be a hunt of a lifetime, really, just going to Texas and doing something completely different. The biggest thing um, for your listeners, for a quick tip uh, with exotics, is um, as much as you've hunted or somebody has hunted whitetail, you have to change your frame of mind when you're hunting an exotic because their vitals are much lower and much more forward. And it's very hard. I've had this happen. It was probably my most miserable moment. Um, I was on an axis hunt. He turned completely, perfectly broadside for me. Um, and they actually have what we call the void between their vitals and then where the rest of their body starts. And if you hit that, you're not going to really do any damage. And your axis deer have, you know, double the lung capacity of a whitetail. We ended up seeing him later on trail cams. And he was fine, so I didn't feel that bad. But we searched that entire night and the next morning, probably a total of 10 hours to try and find him. And when I went back and kind of looked at what I had done, I knew exactly where, what I had done wrong was mentally, all I kept thinking was, you know, aim where your vitals are on a whitetail, but that's wrong. You have to almost put it in the armpit, very low, very upfront and tight on the animal. And that's kind of a, a, a hard thing to get across in your mind after you've been hunting whitetail for so long. Right. It's a whole different ballgame. It is. Yeah. And, they, oh. and like Nina was talking about the antelope. I mean, they are super quick and very, very skittish. Right. 
Gotcha. Yeah. And they don't run, they hop. It's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> they trick you. Yeah, it's cool. Like when they run off, it's like it's like a giant rabbit kind of crosses a kangaroo hopping off. It's cool. Very interesting. And it, that is so cool to think that you have that right here in the United States. You're, you're just a plane ride away. That's excellent. Uh, Hannah, take us through one of your favorite haunts. Um, well, I think I definitely have to say my favorite would be going when we went up to, uh, Canada to get caribou. Um, I was the only girl in the group and I was probably only 14 in a group of, um, much older men, including my father, which was an experience. Um, I have to say a positive one. I was, they were very encouraging and supportive. Um, which was really great for a young woman to experience, but, um, like a couple of key moments, you know, that just stuck out to me were, um, you, we had to go take, um, these tiny zodiac boats across this huge lake to get to the hunting grounds. Um, and, you know, the wind could be whipping like crazy. Uh, so you get your way across and you're hiking through just to see. Uh, it was right up above, it was above the Arctic Circle and just to see the change that in the, um, in nature that can happen in such a quick period of time. You can be in trees sweating, you know, it can be 10 degrees warmer as you're walking and then you get up just, just a little bit higher and there's not a tree to be seen. You're in the tundra. It's the temperatures dropped. It's just tiny little scrub brush. You know, that was really cool to me and, um, just kind of spending your time glassing for animals. And the funniest thing was that, I mean, I don't want to say any animal is stupid, but the, our guide would walk up to the herds with his hands above his head and his fingers spread to imitate antlers. And the caribou would just look at him like, Oh, come on over, friend. Really? What's going on? I mean, it was so amazing. They had never seen a human in their life and by the guide putting his arms up, you know, it was enough that the shape was recognizable, I guess. Huh. Uh, so that was just fascinating to me and definitely I had never shot an animal. Um, it was September, so they were still in velvet. Okay. Uh, which was really amazing to see, you know, come up on this animal and, um, to actually see what it's like in velvet. And some of the men in the group chose to keep their antlers in velvet and how to keep the antlers in velvet they were you know injecting the tips of them with a special serum that drains the blood out so that it doesn't dry out and fall off um so i definitely say you know not only the experience of shooting my first big game animal which was incredible i actually shot it off the shoulder of our guide he let me use his shoulder as a gun rest um <laughs> No kidding. Did he still have his hands above his head while you were doing that? Oh, I have pictures. I have pictures. <laughs> um, but, you know, I still have the shell casing from that first caribou. And uh, we had a big joke from that trip. All Every caribou I shot died in a puddle. And it was like, oh, if Hannah doesn't shoot something in the water, it doesn't count. So we had to keep dragging <laughs> my caribou out of puddles. And um, But, you know, unlike Texas the most interesting there's bears up there and you know wolves and everything but because it was so cold we would um you know gut the animal get prop their leg up with a stick from the woods and then if you shot the animal at 10 o'clock in the morning we'd come back before we hiked and packed out and just leave the animal there all day to cool down and cool off and you know nothing would touch it really so that was really interesting and definitely a fun first experience to be in such a different world while you're hunting I think we have too many predators in Texas. If we leave a deer out, it's going to yeah. get Yeah. My, so my first question to the guy, I was like, um, isn't something going to eat this? And he, <laughs> I, he was a, you know, native, uh, native Canadian. And no, like as if that was ridiculous. Right. Cool. Yeah, you, yeah. You think coyotes, but I guess maybe that's not coyote range, but then you think wolves. Wolves and right? bears. We actually had a bear try to break into our, uh, cabin one night. You know, we're all prepped behind the door with our guns, like, Get ready. Get ready. Right. <laughs> Thankfully, you walked away. But you have a perfectly good caribou down, and they're they're trying to knock on your door to yep. get some honey or something. Who knows? Exactly. Right. Um, talk to me a little bit a little bit about uh, television. You're you're now starting your television adventures, correct? 
Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, we, we filmed our pilot episode, and like everybody else that is, you know, seeking the kind of the same things that we're doing, um, we're in the works with sponsors to prepare, a, you know, a forum and a voice. For the women hunters, we want to um, eventually put on some maybe archery tournaments where we can bring in young girls and and teach them the basics of, of bow hunting and introduce them to the outdoors because not everybody grows up, you know, out in the country and not everybody grows up with family members that have a love for the outdoors. You have kids that are, you know, living in apartments with single parents that don't have the means or the, the education of hunting to get them out there. And so there's a lot of kids out there that have the passion for this that maybe don't have the opportunities to. So we want to kind of be that voice and, um, and reach out. And, and, you know, that's why we write a lot of our blogs, to tell our personal stories and to share our experiences and our mistakes as well, too, so that women and, and little girls and, you know, little, little boys as well can see that, we started at a later age, some of us started at a younger age, and that it is possible to go out there and, and you know, fulfill your passion for something like this. Right. It's Think of Queens of Camo less of a, as of a TV show, more of like a network, a network for people to come and share stories, a network for, you know, um, people to ask questions and just share their passion, whether that be hunting or fishing, just the passion for outdoor, outdoor experiences, out, outdoor hunting, fishing trips, or right. just yeah, animal I'm, watching. It, it just That's what Queens of Camo is about. It's about the, the love of the outdoors. Right. Yeah, definitely. As, like, a new member and as a girl who's sort of, like, played the role as of son and been in a, you know, a, had a support system that's all male, I've seen Queens of Camo for me as being, like, a huge support system and community of women that I can relate to. Like I said on my hunting Canada, I was really impressed with the support of the men that were in the camp, but it would have been nice to have had a woman to look up to, to talk to, um, you know, to say, how's this going to go? How should I approach this? You know, I think young girls and even boys, it would be good for them to have role models. And it's been great for me to have this to build this community of female hunters that we all are sort of sharing the same passion, the same troubles, the same everything. And that's been really fun for me is that like, it's also a support system and a community. Right. It's also kind of a good tool for um, the women out there who their husbands or their boyfriends hunt, but yet women see things from a different perspective and sometimes the guys just can't explain things the right way and you know we'll get frustrated with our husbands like no like i don't understand what you're saying but if i hear it from a woman's perspective sometimes they just have better words or a different way of explaining things and i know um my me and my husband have helped nina in that way because she gets frustrated with her husband so we'll take her out or i'll say hey you know you should try this um i learned from my mistakes and, you know, don't do this because this is what happened to me. You know how, how it is being married. You, you don't listen to your husband when it comes to critiquing. You take offense to it. <laughs> so I, um, I, it was nice to hear it from a woman's perspective and even teaching. Um, Candace has way more patience than my husband does. And just to know, too, because um, bow hunting is fairly new to me. And she's more experienced than I am. And she welcomed me to the world and helped me um, even where I probably would have had a, a longer learning curve, she shortened that by helping me with telling me, you know, what worked for her, what didn't, and, and I really appreciate her for that. So since we can't reach out to every single person individually, then that's where Queens of Camo becomes the, the method of us getting out there through our blogs and through, you know, or like in Hannah's case, she, you know, has amazing recipes that are going to be coming out here soon. She's got a few out right now. Um, but cause that's going to appeal to the women as well to show them that you don't just go out and, you know, kill this animal and that's it. You bring it home, you feed your family with it. It's a way of sustaining life. And I think with the blogs and the forums and, um, we actually have a, uh, probably a trade show tour coming up. We're looking at some new trade shows here in the near future. Uh, there's, we're looking at one in Kansas right now. I think it's the Midwest Hunt Fest. Okay. Um, 
that one's looking pretty good for us. So it's in August. Yeah, it's in August, and um, we're looking to go there because that's actually where the production company is out of is, is Kansas. So we want to kind of get out there and start uh, meeting some of our fans and followers and and interacting with them and and finding the dads that you know are afraid to take their daughters hunting or or the little girls that just you know really aren't sure where to start. So. Right. All right, everybody, that was part one of our interview with the Queens of Camo. Thank you to Candace, Nina, and Hannah for being on the show. And if you would like to reach out to us, you can send me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com, or you could find us on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook is facebook.com, bigbuckregistry, and Twitter is bigbuckregistry. So those are uh, all our all our handles at all the social media. Uh, other than that, uh, we're going to launch into part two uh, with the Queens of Camo next, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll see you next time right here on Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Mm-hmm.